together. Lift our eyes to Jesus. Sing just one word. Just one word. You calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word. The darkness has to retreat. In just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but believe that there's nothing that I God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh, in just one word, you hear what's broken inside. faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus so let faith arise let all agree there's no power Remember 
no wrongs we have done omniscient all-knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord praise the cost and we stood neath the dead we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is more
You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Good morning and welcome to The Creek. My name's Lisa, and whether you're joining us in person or online, we're just so honored that you chose to spend your time with us. If you are newer here at The Creek, we've got a great opportunity for you today. Our Welcome to The Creek lunch is a fantastic way for you to find out what The Creek is all about, to meet some of our staff members, and to even find some ways that you can get plugged in and involved. So if you're newer here, we would love to have you join us. Today at 1215, lunch is free and families are welcome. If you were here with us last week, you know we had such an amazing experience in celebrating the resurrection of Jesus together. And one of the most spectacular, exciting moments was watching 57 people enter the waters of our baptistry and dedicate their lives to Jesus. We welcome all of them along with several more who are being baptized today. And if you were sitting out there last week thinking, maybe I should look into this baptism thing, we wanna provide you with some resources. You can go to thecreek.org slash baptism to find out more, or you can meet with any one of our staff members or guest service volunteers in the lobby after worship. We not only celebrate all the baptisms we had last week, we wanna celebrate your generosity. We told you that the funds that went into the orange buckets, those buckets that are at the giving stations around the room, the funds from last week were all earmarked to go for tornado relief at Whiteland. You guys gave just under $10,000 last week in our generous buckets. Thank you for your outrageous generosity. Thank you for supporting our friends and our community who are experiencing damage from this tor recent tornadoes. And thank you for being for the 317. Today we start a new sermon series, Unearthed. Our lead pastor, Dan Hamill, is gonna come out and share with us. So let's prepare our hearts to receive God's word together. Well, good morning. It is wonderful to be at church with you today. I want to give a special welcome to anyone who is newer with us. Uh, last week, we saw nearly 1,000 guests visit us for Easter weekend. And I know there's a few people who uh, came to church for the very first time uh, last week, and you're back with us again. And we're so glad, so honored that you are here. Yeah, can we extend a welcome? Th thank you for being with us. Now, I know there are some other parents in the room who, like Karen and I, have been so grateful the last two weeks for some warm spring weather, because for four or five months, all of our kids have been cooped up in the house, and tensions were getting, getting, getting kind of high, and it was just so nice the last few weeks to just let the kids out and run and play and be on the, the swing set and, and just, you know, give us a little bit of breather in the house. That was nice, too. Uh, if you're newer here and haven't got the chance to know my family yet, I've got three children. I've got a son named Luke, who turns one this week. I've got a baby girl, Addie. She's two and a half, and a son named Hudson. He's four. And the older two kids, they do a great job almost all the time playing together. They're great friends. They connect really well. But on occasion, instead of being polite and sharing and, you know, treating each other how we've trained them to teach each other, they just revert to their base human instincts. But it comes out in different ways for each of them. Like Addie, my girl, she will go to Hudson while he's playing with one of his toys, and she'll just take it from him. Well, Hudson's like surprised by it. He sees this little girl take his thing, and he's bigger, he's stronger, he just goes and he takes it back. And the moment Hudson takes back his toy, Addie loses her mind. She thinks one of the greatest injustices in the history of humanity has been perpetrated against her. And she, you know, begins to cry and, and flail and, you know, demand that she get Hudson's toy back. That's how it works for Addie. For Hudson, it works a little bit differently. Uh, Hudson uses the fact that he's a little bit older and he understands a little bit more, he's got a little bit more maturity. He uses it sometimes to torment his sister. So a couple months ago, we were having a mouse problem in our house, and I had tried for a couple weeks to trap this mouse using one of the spring-loaded traps, and I'd never encountered this before in catching mice, but almost every day I would you know, have a fresh bait on the, the, the trap, 
I'd come back in the morning, and the bait would be gone. Like, entirely gone, but the spring wouldn't go. But I would check the spring, and it would, I was like, this is a really smart mouse, so I have to up my game. So I went and got the glue traps. So I laid a couple of these glue traps out, and I put some cheese in the middle. And Hudson understood fully what was going on, so he wouldn't get in trouble here. But there was a time that I was here at church, and Karen was feeding Luke and decided to put on a show so the kids would stay, you know, they'd, they'd stay occupied while she was feeding our youngest. And Hudson decided to take Addie upstairs to our laundry room and show her the glue trap and convinced her that, the, that, that, uh, that, that Daddy had put the cheese there for her. <laughs> so while Karen is trying to feed our youngest, she just hears this commotion, Addie's crying, she comes out, and that glue trap is plastered right to Addie's face. It's all caught up in her hair, and that is how our baby girl got her very first haircut. It was, it, it couldn't even be fixed. So you see that, and you know, these kids can be so sweet and so precious, and they can play together so well at times, and other times they take something that doesn't belong to them, they cry, they manipulate, they deceive, and it gets kind of toxic. And you would hope, right, you would hope that that thing in kids, which is you know, just a result of immaturity, and, and they're so young, they don't really know themselves that well yet, they don't know each other that well, they don't know relationships that well yet. You would think, well, just like, like kids' teeth, they fall out after a certain time, and they get, you know, adult teeth, they get permanent teeth. You would think that that brokenness, that deception, that darkness inside of them is just going to, like, drop off and get replaced with something good and permanent. But you know the human story. As we get older, that brokenness inside of us doesn't just fall away. It just grows with us, and it gets bigger, and it gets darker, and it gets even more destructive. And you play it out on the global scale, and that is, that is the root behind the war between Russia, Russia and Ukraine right now. You play it out at a societal level, and that is the reason behind the shooting down in Nashville a few weeks ago, the shooting at the bank in Louisville just last week. That is the reason behind the corruption in the heart, the deceit, the dysfunction. That's the reason behind corruption in the politics in Washington right now, and it's also the reason behind the, the corruption in the politics at your, at your office where you work right now. That's the root behind the, the prison system. That's the, the root behind infidelity, the root behind divorce, the root behind family feuds where siblings or sometimes parents and kids will go decades without even talking to one another and there's bad, bad blood. So often, people will look at what's not right and they'll blame the person of the other political party. They'll find someone of a different skin color than them or a different cultural background and they'll say, well, it's, it's, it's that, it's them. People want to find something external. No one wants to do the difficult work of looking internal. They want to blame the system. But for as long as human history records, and we're talking about thousands of years, there have been tens of thousands of different systems that have been tried, and every one of these systems have produced people that have brokenness and dysfunction and deceit and hatred. And so you have to realize it's probably not the system. It's probably not something outside. It's probably something inside. It's not society as a whole. It's the people. It's the individuals that make up society. There's something in here that's not quite right. And that's the case for every human being. In the early 1900s, one of the most popular newspapers in Europe, the, the Times of London, asked its readers this question. What's the problem with the world? And they asked people to write in and, you know, answer this all-important question. What's the problem with the world? One of the leading theologians of the day, G.K. Chesterton, wrote in and with just two words gave this answer. I am. If we are brave enough to be quiet enough and look long enough and be honest enough, we will see some things in our hearts that we are not proud are there we'll probably see that there's some dysfunction from uh, our family of origin that, that we inherited. And then if you're at a place in life where you have been married and you've had kids of your own, you will see some of your dysfunction passed on to your kids. Uh, we will see that there are some lusts in our heart 
And sometimes those lusts result in disordered desires. And sometimes those disordered desires are, are powerful and they lead us to do things that we are ashamed of. And we end up in cycles of, of addiction. And instead of doing something that's wrong and then bringing it into the open and telling people about it and getting help, we deceive, we cover up, and we wear masks and we have an artificial self that we project to everyone and we're terrified if anyone were to ever find out. For others, the issue is pride. And almost everything you do is driven by your need to compete or win or have someone validate you and say that you are enough because there's this deep insecurity about your, your self-worth, which has been there since as early as you can remember. Or for others, it has to do with fear and with anxiety. And you lay asleep at night, not for minutes before you, you go to bed, but for hours just worrying about what if, and there's these, these things that you know you can't control at all that plague your mind and refuse to give you sleep. There's so much uh, bro brokenness, so much dislocation, so much that is, that is out of alignment in our hearts. And that is why we're doing this 10-part sermon series called Unearthed. We don't want to just stay on the surface and talk about the easy things, and we don't want to just go like one layer beneath the surface. We want to go 5, 10, 15, 20 layers deep to expose the root of the issue in our hearts, the root of the issue in our own lives. Not blame another person, not blame a system, not blame our parents, not blame our teachers. Look at the issues in our hearts. And with it being uncovered, with it being exposed, allow the presence of God to meet us there. Allow the grace and the mercy of God to meet us there so that we can be transformed so that we can bring our whole selves to God and offer all that we have and are transformed by his grace as, as an offering of worship to him. And so we can be the most Christ-like version of ourselves in our own relationship with ourself as well as our relationship with other people. That's the heart behind this series. But because this series is called Unearth, and we're going to be going deep and pulling some layers back and looking at some, some root issues, some dysfunction, some unhealth, some sin in our lives, I'm just going to give you the, the warning up front. It's going to be an uncomfortable sermon series. Like, we're going to hit on some nerves, some nerves for the whole room and maybe some nerves just for you. And I want to encourage you to have the courage and have the discipline and the consistency to stick with this sermon series and let it get uncomfortable. Let there be some things that are unearthed in your heart so that God, having unearthed it, can shine light on it and meet you in that place where maybe he hasn't met you even though you've been following him for years or decades now. This sermon series, I think in a lot of ways, is going to be like going to the dentist. And everyone knows they should go to the dentist, but some people don't because they're afraid. They're afraid of what they're going to find out. They don't want anyone to do the exam. But you, you go to the dentist ultimately, and they'll take those x-rays, and you'll get an oral exam. And sometimes afterwards, the dentist, he or she, will sit down with you and they'll show you on the x-ray where something's not right. And you probably knew it already because they had a little bit of pain there. But they'll show you where there's decay. They'll call it a cavity. So, so something needs to be addressed. And addressing it's not comfortable. They're going to tell you what it is. They're going to tell you maybe even the price it's going to pay. And no one's going to force you. But then you get to choose if you're going to allow the dentist to drill and replace that which is that which is causing pain and that which would spread with something that is permanent and will promote your health and overall well-being. You can get up and leave if you want to. You can say, I don't want to spend the time, I don't want to spend the money, I don't want to go through the, the, the shot and maybe, maybe, maybe the pain. Or if you allow the dentist to remove the decay and replace it with that which is permanent, you can have oral health that will last you, hopefully, for the rest of your life. You get to decide, and that's what the sermon series is going to be. There's going to be a, a, kind of an x-ray, not on your, your teeth, but an x-ray of your soul. There might, I can't promise you, but there might be some areas of decay and dysfunction and unhealth that are exposed. And I think God is going to be the great physician, and not force you, but invite you to let him do this transformative, redemptive work. This is a sermon series that I have been planning for four and a half years. And we had intended on numerous occasions to, to do this series, but every time I got ready to do it, it just seemed like God was uh, putting a, a check 
on my heart and saying, it's not quite time yet. It's not quite time yet. But for some reason, I feel like the Lord has said, uh, now's the time. And maybe there's even something specific in your heart and in your life or in your relationships that God wants to do. So for such a time as this. Let's pray, and then we'll dive in. God, I thank you for meeting us here. I thank you for every person who is, who is with us today. And we come expectantly. We come with a little bit of fear and trepidation, knowing that this uh, might be a little bit more uncomfortable than a normal sermon or a normal series. But we come and we ask God that these next 10 weeks, you would meet us, you would speak to us, you would heal us, you would do that deep, redemptive work. And you would transform us, God, in the deepest places where we really need to encounter your grace and your love. God, for every person here, for the relationships represented, for the families represented, for our church as a whole, God, do a great work in us. We, we, just, we ask you, great physician, to come and bring healing in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this series is 10 weeks long, and we're going to be looking at the Old Testament at 10 different characters who God met in some areas of personal pain and personal brokenness. And we're going to see them as kind of like examples or a lens through which we can understand God wanting to meet us and God wanting to do a work of grace in our own lives. And we're going to start at the very beginning today with Adam and Eve. And with Adam and Eve, kind of the theme is it was never meant to be this way. It was never meant to be this way. Like when God creates the world and he creates humanity to live in the world, everything was, was right. Brokenness was not part of their experience. It wasn't part of their, their, their understanding of how the world works. But within short order, there was dislocation. There was disharmony. There was disruption when sin entered it. And now there's, there's frustration. There's, there's the tension knowing that God did create a good world. But the world has pain in it. It has brokenness and, and heartache in it that was never intended to be there. And this hit me like a ton of bricks on Tuesday morning of, of last week. So every Tuesday morning here at church, all of our, our pastors and all of our staff meet together for roughly a 30-minute gathering. And we get together and we spend the first 10 or 15 minutes and we celebrate all the ways that we saw God at work over the weekend, the life changes, the, the guests we got to meet, anyone who made the decision to be baptized, and we just we, we praise God for the way we saw him at work. And so this Tuesday, we had so much to give God praise for. We saw like a thousand guests here on, on Easter. We saw 57 people make the decision to be baptized. I mean, if you have said yes to, to the call of God to enter into vocational ministry to do this for your living, you, just, you pinch yourself on these mountaintop experiences. It's one of the, the greatest weekends I'd ever been a part of. And we were so excited. That's the first part of the meeting. But in the second part of the meeting, we share our prayer requests with one another. And things going on in our own lives and things going on in, in your lives, things that are happening in our families, things that are happening in our church family. Like, what do we need to be praying about? And after doing the, all this celebration and, and praise and, and thanking God and standing in awe of how he had worked, we then heard stories of people on our staff who, whose family members have cancer or whose family members have just a few weeks left on this earth. One of the guys on our staff said that he was really close friends with the four people from Indianapolis who were down in Florida, and all of them died on, in a plane accident just last week. And he's dealing with his own grief, but also wanting to step in for, his, for those people's families who were shocked and uh, not, not processing through this with the, with the peace that you would hope, because not all of them have the same relationship with Jesus that those who died had. Uh, there were requests from within the congregation where several people in our church the week leading up to Easter died. One man lost his life unexpectedly through a medical event. Uh, another person was in hospice, but on Saturday, the day before Easter, he passed away. His widow not only had to say goodbye to her husband on Saturday, but just a few days later, her, her mom passed as well. Just heartache and grief all around. A friend on, on, of ours on staff, someone we all know and love dearly, experienced a miscarriage recently. So sitting with them in the grief of having to say goodbye to a baby who they love, but they never had the chance to hold or meet. 
And we went from like being on this mountaintop, one of the highest of highs, to now walking with Jesus in the valley of the shadow of death. And everyone knows, like, there's these good things that you cannot deny. Like, God is real, and he's moving, and he's active. And yet things are broken, and there's pain, and there's heartache, and just sitting in this tension. If, if you've ever sat in that tension where you, you know that there's a God, and you know that, that there are, there, there's blessings and evidence of his presence all around, and there's also this pain and heartache and break, brokenness and confusion and questions, like the Bible, more than any other religious document, more than any other faith system, I mean, the Bible addresses that down to the letter. I mean, the Bible tells us that when God created the world, he created it good. If we were to just do an overview of Genesis chapter 1, we're going to see how good the world that God created really was. Look at these review statements after everything that God did to create. I mean, God created the light, and then he saw that it was good. God creates the land and the sea. He saw that it was good. God creates the trees and the vegetation. He saw that it was good. God creates the sun, the moon, the stars. He saw that it was good. We see later on the chapter that God creates the sea animals and the birds. He saw that it was good. Genesis 1:27. God creates the land animals. He saw that it was good. And then the summary statement at the end of Genesis chapter 1, God saw that everything he made, now including humanity, wasn't just good, but was very good. When God creates the world, he creates it with perfection. He creates it to be whole and complete without any error or mistake. The world, the way the Bible describes it, was under complete shalom. Uh, Shalom, the most basic definition, which you may well know, is peace. And peace is a good definition for the word shalom, but it's, shalom is so much more encompassing than just peace. Shalom means harmony. It means completeness. It means tranquility. My, my favorite definition is shalom means equilibrium. It means that everything is in perfect balance, and it's just the way God intended it to be. Equilibrium. Uh, the, the best word picture that I can think of for this is let's say that you were out in Colorado and you are hiking the Rocky Mountains. And you're, I don't know, 9,000, 10,000 feet above sea level, and the air is crisp and thin, and there's you know, these beautiful pines everywhere. And you, you kind of, you, you, you come up a certain summit, and you're on like this plateau area, and you, you look in front of you, and there's this beautiful mountain lake, 20, 30 acres large, I mean, a, a, a nice-sized lake. And it's, it's a cloudless day. The sun is in the sky. There's no wind. You're there all alone in creation. And you look at this lake, and it is, it's like glass. It's, it's not almost still, it's perfectly still. And you look at it, and because it's so still, you can see the mirror reflection of the snow-capped peak that's right behind it. That's equilibrium. That's shalom. Everything in perfect balance and harmony. And because it's, because it's like glass, it can... It can give a perfect reflection of the image behind it. When God creates the world and he creates humanity, he creates us in his image. And originally, everything about humanity was a mere reflection of the image of God, his love, his goodness, his grace. But then sin enters the equation and sin disrupts everything. And we, can, we cannot minimize the weight and the impact of sin. Sometimes we think, oh, it's just a small sin. It's just a little bit of lie, a little bit of selfishness. And we, we think that, that sin is like taking maybe a pebble that we have in our pocket and just flicking it into the lake. And it's just a little ripple, a little splash here, there. And all of a sudden, it's, it's fine. Well, maybe it's not quite like that, but we think about the largest rock we can pick up, depending on your strength. I don't know, 100 pounds, 200 pounds, and you, you, you heave it in. Okay, it's a lot bigger, right? The splash is larger and the ripples are more intense, but sooner or later it's all going to be calm again. No, that's not what sin is. I mean, the Bible says very specifically that sin, not like a pebble, not like a a, a boulder, sin is like a meteor coming at 5,000 miles an hour, smashing into that lake. It disrupts everything, and it will never be the same again. That's the weight, that's the impact of sin. And I want to open up, if you have your Bibles, open up with me to Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to read about the introduction of sin into the world and see some of the consequences that came. We're going to, we're going to learn the, the essence of our, our, our takeaway for today, that it was never meant to be this way. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. 
He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And so the the enemy begins by questioning the, the commands of God. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, so now saying there's no consequences for disobeying God. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So now the serpent is saying that God is keeping something good from you and he has some sort of ill intent in his heart in giving you these commands. And so, you know, the enemy begins by sowing distrust in the goodness, the character, and the provision of God. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said to them, who told you you were naked? Have you you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So here we see the narrative of sin entering into the world. And then uh, throughout the rest of Genesis chapter 3, we see the consequences that come because of sin. First, God looks to the serpent who tempted Eve and says, here are the consequences of sin for you. And then God looks at Eve and says, here are the consequences for you. And then God looks at Adam and says, here are the consequences for you. There are these unavoidable consequences that come when sin enters the equation. And it's not like God is vindictive. It's not like he's punitive. It's not like he, he, he loves doling out punishment. The consequences for sin are a lot like the consequences of, of, of being on a hike, seeing a cliff, and deciding to walk over the edge of that cliff. No one's trying to punish you for making a bad decision. Gravity exists. Gravity itself punishes you, if you will, when you decide to put your foot where there is no ground to hold you up. And when we decide to sin, when we have disordered loves, when we take the place of God, when we reject his commands and his ways, there is no way to, there, there's no way to avoid the consequences of living disaligned with the way that God created the universe. Uh, not long ago, I was here at church working on a sermon, and my, uh, my, my phone went off, and it was Karen. She sent me a text. I want to just read for you the message that my wife sent me. It says, Hudson broke the toy tree house we have in the basement. He then lied about it and told me that Addie did it. He lied about it for 15 minutes. Then he finally confessed and told the truth. So I told him I was going to have to spank him for lying, and that I was going to spank him as hard as Daddy spanks him. I then spanked him as hard as I could. He immediately turned around and said, Mom, that was a really good try. (laughs) But you are not as strong as Daddy. His spankings are many times harder. (laughs) So so I just got home, and I pulled my son aside, and I said, hey, you know, you got to tell the truth, but let me tell you something I've learned. Don't talk trash to your mother. It's not going to end well for you. And, you know, it's not that a that a mom or a dad enjoys disciplining their child, some things have built-in consequences to them. And when we sin, there are built-in consequences that truly are unavoidable. Now, when it comes to these built-in consequences and sin, you know, the Bible says that if, to, to Eve, if you eat this fruit, you will die. The enemy says, surely you won't. You, you, you won't certainly die. And it, it's true in a way, right? I mean, Adam and Eve ate that fruit, and they didn't just have a heart attack and keel over dead. They didn't die on the spot like some would have anticipated. And yet, when they sinned, they invited death into the equation for mankind. When they sinned, death 
ultimately became the, the, the telos or the end of every entity within our entire cosmos, not just for humanity, but for the animal kingdom, for the earth itself, for our solar system. I mean, black holes exist, and there are supernovas. and like, The whole universe is now on a trajectory towards death, and it happened when sin entered into the equation. Sin disrupts everything. Uh, it's, don't think about death so much as dying in a moment, but, but the second law of thermodynamics now becoming a reality for everyone. The law of increasing entropy, of increasing disorder. Now we cannot escape the fact that we are on a trajectory that ultimately result in decay and death. You know, everyone hopefully in their teenage years and in their 20s, has a healthy body. They can run and jump and play and they recover quickly, but then you get into your 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and beyond, and all of a sudden you don't have the same energy you had when you were young. All of a sudden your skin is not as tight as it used to be. Wrinkles set in. Your muscle max begins to fade. You, you, know, you get to a certain point where arthritis sets in, and sometimes even mentally the, the, the memories and, and, and the wit begins to dim, and sooner or later, all of us will draw our last breath. The second law of thermodynamics, increasing entropy, entropy, death as the trajectory of every entity in the cosmos is now a reality. And sin is what brought that disruption. If you look at this, this section a little bit deeper, you're going to see that sin breaks four types of relationships. Sin begins by breaking our relationship with God. Sin breaks our relationship with God. This is the first domino to fall. After Adam and Eve eat the, the fruit, after they choose to sin, God comes into the garden to walk with them. And it's not like God was just trying to get, a, you know, get his steps in. To walk is the Bible's way of saying to have an intimate relationship with someone, to know them and to be known by them. That's what God desired in his relationship with humanity. But after they sin, God comes walking in the garden, and what do Adam and Eve do? They hide. Now they're afraid of being seen. Now they're afraid of being known. They, they place themselves at a distance from God. And ultimately, they have to be sent away from the garden. They spend the rest of their lives east of Eden. Sin truncated their relationship with God and change the nature of it forever. But it's not just our relationship with God. Sin breaks our relationship with ourselves. Sin brings a type of psychological dislocation where we don't have a right relationship even inside of ourselves. Sin is like, it's like driving your car and never changing the oil. And you might go a handful of, of, of months you might go 10,000 miles, 15, depending on your vehicle, 20,000 miles, and you don't, you, don't, you don't feel it. But sooner or later, it destroys the engine. And sin does things to ourselves that we, we can't hide from, we can't deny. Sin causes us to lie to ourselves about ourselves. Sin causes us to lie to other people about ourselves so that we look better and our narrative is what we want it to be. Sin causes us to be driven by pride at times, and insecurity causes us to prove ourselves to others at times. Sin causes us to uh, have cycles of addiction, and instead of being in an addiction, reaching out for help and trying uh, to take the right steps to get better, we stay in that, that addiction because of shame. Uh, sin with the the disruption of our own relationship can result in anxiety. It can result in uh, the need for constant counseling and constant medical assistance. And, you know, there's all times where, where people need real counseling or they, they, they need medication, but there's other times where we're just not willing to be quiet with ourselves, and so we're looking for a, a crutch because our relationship with ourself is broken. Sin is what brings that about. Sin breaks our relationship not just with God and ourselves, but our relationship with others. As soon as they sin, what happens next? They, they begin covering themselves up. Adam and Eve were married. They, they, they knew each other completely, but now they're ashamed. Now they hide from one another. This is the beginning of self-preservation. This is the beginning of power dynamics at play in relationships. 
And when God comes to Adam and says, what happened? Does he own up to it and take responsibility? No. As soon as God asks Adam what happened, the woman who you put here, he's blaming both the woman for doing it and God for putting the woman there for doing it. He doesn't take responsibility himself. Then God asks Eve what all happened, and she blames the serpent who was in the garden. Relationships go from unity and love and trust and knowledge to now separation and fear and blame. And when God looked at Eve, he said, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. There would be something specifically in her psyche that she would look for validation and and, and worth and meaning from another human being. But that, that other human being, instead of meeting her there and loving her there, would rule over her and dominate her. There's brokenness in our relationships, not just with God and ourselves, but with others. And then finally, sin breaks our relationship with our environment. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, it was paradise. I mean, in the garden, there was fruit from limitless trees available without any effort. Adam and Eve enjoyed a peaceful, restful relationship with their environment, but sin breaks that. Look at verses 17 through 19 with me. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. So they had this relationship with their environment that was effortless and symbiotic and peaceful. And then sin comes and brings thorns and thistles and sweat. And now the physical environment is cursed as well. And we have things like poison ivy and honeysuckle and earthquakes and tornadoes. Sin breaks everything. So if you've ever thought to yourself, the world doesn't feel right. There's these unbelievable good things that I cannot deny. Like there's expressions of grace that I'm thankful for. And yet at the same time, all that's true, there's this brokenness. There's, there's this distance I feel from God. Like when I speak, I don't know that he's near. Or there's this, this, this strange unsettledness that I have in my own heart. And that's why I watch so much TV. That's why I, I drink so much alcohol. That's why I keep on going to the pills. It's because I, I, I just can't be alone with myself. Have you ever wondered why there's so much dysfunction and toxicity in all of your relationships? Have you ever wondered why there's challenges in your family? Have you ever wondered why co-worker relationships just keep on, end up not working out well? Do you, do you wonder why you look at the world and you say, why is so much craziness going on? The Bible has been speaking to this for thousands of years. God made a good world, but sin entered into it. It was never meant to be this way. But the good news for us is not simply that the Bible explains our present reality and speaks into our confusion and our questions and our frustration. The Bible tells us that God has a plan for what to do about it. Not only does God speak to Adam and Eve and tell them the consequences for their sin, God speaks to the serpent, who was representing Satan in the story, our spiritual enemy. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, this is God speaking to the serpent, and this is what we hear. I will, this is God to the enemy, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Genesis 3.15, this is what theologians refer to as the proto-evangelion, which in Latin means the first gospel. As soon as sin enters into the world, God himself proclaims the gospel. He speaks the good news that he is going to do something about it. Yes, it wasn't meant to be this way, and it won't always be this way. God is going to come to the rescue. And there's three aspects to this gospel that God preaches. First, he says, I'm going to put enmity between your offspring and hers. This is God, if you read between the lines, saying he's actually going to to become human. He's going to take on flesh and be born of a woman. This is uh, looking forward to the incarnation when Jesus Christ, God himself, will wear our flesh. And why does God come to our earth and walk a mile in our shoes? Well, God says next, he will crush your head through 
living a perfect human life, Jesus is able to overcome the power of darkness. He is able to defeat Satan. He is able to deal that death blow to the one who brought death into our story. But how will he do it? Or you will strike his heel. This is a reference to to the cross event, to Satan striking at Jesus. What he believes will, will, will be a great victory over heaven, but it is in that very attempted victory where Jesus is put on the cross that Christ himself overcomes the power of darkness and stamps out evil once and for all. And through that, God begins the process of putting everything that is wrong with the world right. He begins recreation. He begins restoration. And we are now on a trajectory towards not just heaven, but towards new creation, not just our personal relationship with God being made right, but everything being made right because of what God has done. As soon as sin entered the world, God said that he would enter the world. God saw, he saw all the brokenness, all the pain, all the internal turmoil, all the hostility and hatred that would come, and he was not content to leave us in that place. He said that he would come, and he wouldn't just come, he would take it all upon himself. He would be limited in his humanity. He would take the hatred, he would take the abuse, he would take the brokenness, he would take the lashes, He would take even death itself. But his power and his love would ultimately overcome sin and overcome darkness and overcome the grave. That's that's the gospel message. Yes, it was not always meant to be this way. And it will not always be this way because of what God has done. And perhaps the clearest presentation of this is in the book of Romans where the Apostle Paul is speaking, not just about how sin came and corrupted the world, but how Jesus came to to set the world right again. Romans chapter 5, look what we read. Consequently, just as one trespass from Adam resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act from Jesus resulted in justification and life For all people. For just as through the disobedience of Adam, the many were made sinners, so through the obedience of Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Adam and Eve sinned and everything got messed up. Jesus is the new Adam. He is the truly human one. And his one act of obedience, his perfect life, and then his substitutionary death on the cross begins to spread the ripple of grace and love and redemption everywhere. He's beginning the process of putting it all back together by his power and by his love. I, I began uh, the message by telling you about uh, my, my, my children. Uh, my, my little girl, Addie, at two and a half, is making it all-time precious. I mean, just the, the sweetest season of life. Addie is my alarm clock. She comes into my room, and she's the one who wakes me up every morning. She typically comes in holding a blanket, sometimes holding a doll, and she just comes to my side of the bed and puts her hands up, and I pick her up, and she comes into the bed with us for a few moments, and she'll stay. I'll stay there as long as she'll stay there. Sometimes it's three minutes, sometimes it's 30 minutes, but I just enjoy those snuggles. They're so sweet, and then inevitably, whenever she's done, she'll just say, I'd like some chocolate milk. So, I get up, and I take her and Hudson, and we go downstairs, and I get them chocolate milk, and I begin to get their food ready. And after Addie has eaten her breakfast, she always, every single day, says, I want to wear a princess dress, which for her means any dress. She knows princesses wear dress, and she likes to be a princess, and so she says, can I wear a princess dress? And so I say, head on up to your room, and she will pick out one of her mini dresses. She'll come down, and I will help her put it on. And then every single time after she gets her dress on, she does a little twirl, and I look at her, and I say, Beauty, beauty. And we have an Amazon Alexa in our house, and and so as soon as she gets her dress on, she always just says, Alexa, play Once Upon a Dream. And then the Sleeping Beauty soundtrack starts, and I lift her up, and we'll just spend two or three minutes uh, dancing together. This is every morning at the Hamill House. My daughter loves princesses, and every day she wears a princess dress. 
uh, just uh, last, uh, last, sun, uh, last, East, last Sunday on Easter. Uh, Addie was here. This is, her, this is her princess dress. Okay, She was running around in a friend's backyard collecting eggs. She was wearing that exact same dress about a month ago. It was in the morning. She was so excited, and she had to go out to the garage to get her shoes. Well, I've been doing a lot of yard work, and I had a lot of mud in our garage, and she slipped and fell, and she got a big dirt stain all down her, her long pink sleeve, and she came in in tears. I mean, crocodile tears just flowing down her cheeks. Daddy, Daddy, I'm not your princess anymore. She saw the stain, she knew it was wrong, and she, she didn't feel whole. She didn't feel complete. And, you know, as a dad, he just rushed over there to pick up your little girl. And he, I can get that out. You'll always be my princess. That is the Father's heart for all of us. I mean, he, 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 he makes us sinless and, and, and pure, and, and everything is right. But in, in, in our own error, it's not just sin that we inherited from, from Adam and Eve and from our, our, our family. Like in our own sin, like we end up with, with, with filth. There are there's stains all over us. And we might have the tendency to, to allow condemnation to win the day. I'm not worthy. I, I can, cannot be in your family. I'm not, not worthy to be called a daughter, not worthy, worthy to be called a son. But God is our loving Father. He runs to us. He scoops us up. And he says... I can get that stain out. You'll always be my child. And I hope that if you are here today, and maybe this is even your, your, your first time here or you're brand new, uh, the gospel message speaks truth about your situation. There is brokenness. There is pain. There is dislocation. This is not the way it's supposed to be. But the gospel message does not leave us in that place. The gospel message tells us that God has run to us, promised to make us new, and we have that eternal hope because God has said yes through the incarnation of Jesus, through dying on the cross for our sins and from rising, rising from the dead. So I'm going to uh, uh, ask us to respond in a number of different ways. Uh, this is an invitation to anyone who follows Jesus. We have uh, uh, communion stations around uh, the worship center. And if you haven't already, you can make your way there and uh, grab the elements for communion. The juice represents the blood of Christ. The, the bread represents the body of Christ. And you're going to have a few moments right now to just thank Jesus for entering into your brokenness, paying the ultimate price, and bringing you back to God. We're also going to open the doors to the porch. And if you would like to be able to have a conversation with someone about something that's going on in your life, maybe there's some brokenness that you're being mindful of right now, and you want a trusted, like a trustworthy, godly person to sit with and connect with and pray over you, we would love to be able to do that at the porch. I'm also going to invite some of our, our staff members and pastors around this church uh, to come forward, not just down here, but also at the balcony. And this is space. You don't have to go to the porch. We just want to normalize meeting with God in a prayerful way in our worship center during service. So if you would like to just make your way to, to one of these people who are, are up front or around here, just tell them your name and let them have the privilege of praying over you during this time of communion and this time of worship. Let's go to God together, and you can respond as you feel that. God, we thank you for, just thank you, God, for, God, we, God, we thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for your presence and your power in our lives. We thank you for what you have in store at this church and in our lives these next few months. Help us to not be afraid. Help us to not check out, but help us to be open and available and willing for you to God do that deep penetrating work and transform us where we need it most. God, right now, meet us with your grace and with your love. Transform us and help us to truly, sincerely connect with you. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Respond as the Lord leads.
We are so excited to celebrate with Justin, along with Olivia and Bailey and Tony, who also entered our baptistry and dedicated their lives to Jesus during our nine o'clock service. If you're like me and you are eager to dig deeper into the material that uh, this sermon series is gonna provide us, we have some resources for you. You can go to thecreek.org slash unearthed. There you can order a print copy of the journal that has been designed to accompany this series, or you can download a digital version of it to read on your iPad or your phone or your Kindle. We also have a podcast that is a companion piece to this series that's been created especially for us. It's gonna be incredible. I highly encourage you to check it out. Thank you guys so much for coming today. Don't get wet on your way out, and we will see you next Sunday. God bless.